Hi, good morning. Welcome to the first Grand Rounds of the new academic year. Uh, we're delighted to have all of you with us today on this kind of perfect autumnal New York City day. Uh, with help from Avinash, our chief resident who's working with me on our Grand Rounds lectures for this year, we have a really great lineup uh, for the fall. It includes an update on asthma, updates on breast cancer, screening and treatment, hepatitis C management in the age of very, very effective antivirals and how that's impacted transplants and how we think about transplants. A really great lecture on healthcare systems and how they sometimes fail the populations that we're charged with caring for. Our annual QI roundtable. We have an integrative medicine lecture, which will focus on that as a specialty, but also as it relates to physician wellness and physician's sense of health, their own personal health. Uh, we're going to talk about TB and an update on TB. Neil Schluger from, from Columbia is going to give that talk. And then we're going to talk to you about caring for the homeless and how that fits into the mission of an institution such as this one. It's our tradition to kick off a new academic year with a, with a really special talk that, that speaks to our mission and also speaks to the broad imperative we all have to think about all patients and their needs as we go forth in healthcare. And in that vein, we're so delighted to have Iselma Fergus with us today, who is the director of CV Cardiovascular Disparities for the Department of Cardiology at Mount Sinai Hospital and for the system, as well an associate professor in medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Fergus received her undergraduate degree from Barnard, her medical degree from SUNY Downstate, and then completed her internal medicine residency training and her chief residency year at Montefiore, completing her training in cardiology at Cornell and has gone on as I reviewed her many accomplishments to really develop a career both as an expert clinician and also as a public intellectual and someone who understood her role to be that of needing to go out into the communities that are most important to her to talk about cardiovascular health. And as she often says, talk about the fact that cardiovascular death is the number one cause of mortality in women in the United States. She's received many recognitions through her work as a past president of the, um, the Westchester branch of the American, I just lost my, go ahead, say it, American Heart Association. Thank you so much. Uh, she received the Red Dress Award from Women's Day Magazine. And in that same vein, she's a frequent uh, interviewee for publications such as uh, Women's Day and CNN, Black in America, and other such publications. And as I say, does that as part of her understanding of her charge as a public intellectual talking about cardiovascular health. She's also the founder and director of Healthy Hearts and has done really wonderful work in Harlem, helping women and people in general to think about themselves and their culture and their background and the way that we failed them but want to do better going forward in terms of protecting their hearts and having, helping them to live happy and healthful lives. Dr. Fergus, we're so happy to have you with us today and welcome. Good morning, everyone. I hope after that illustrious introduction, I don't disappoint, but I'm happy to be here. I'm very passionate about um, my work that I do in um, underserved communities um, here in Central Harlem and also um, in the Caribbean as well. But I recognize that um, just simply um, getting involved and getting involved at a grassroots level and focusing on prevention, oftentimes uh, we're able to address all the downstream issues that occur. And so it's the same thing with heart disease in women. Um, and today I was asked to give you some updates on where we stand in 2019 uh, with heart disease um, in women. So without further ado, I have no disclosures relative to this discussion. And uh, the objectives that I hope to accomplish is really just to lay the landscape of where we stand in 2019 
um, in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease prevention and management and treatment for women, uh, and just review some of the contributors, but also recognizing that all women are not the same. So as our our uh, our country, the population becomes more diverse, maybe there are particular risk factors that you should focus on in some women versus the other to um, uh, allow for um, equal outcomes when it com comes to uh, cardiovascular disease, morbidity and mortality. And then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the uh, diagnostic modalities that may, may work best for women. So this is the slide that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and what this shows is the mortality trends of men and women across a couple decades. And uh, you could see that um, somewhere around the year 2000 or so, um, that was the peak. Um, this red line represents um, mortality trends for women. And uh, you could see that here it sort of plateaued and then started to come down. And this, at this point, uh, was where people really recognized that um, we need to address uh, issues. We need to address, in particular, um, hormonal issues and uh, diagnostic issues for women. So this was when the HRT um, uh, study came out, but at the same time, many of the campaigns that you're aware of today, like the Go Red for Women um, campaign, the American Heart Association, NHLBI Red Dress, all of these sort of came uh, to be around this time. And uh, you could see a significant downtrend over the years for women. So what happened here in 2012? <laughs> now we're starting to see an uptick again um, in terms of um, mortality trends for women. And I submit to you that um, if you were to separate these lines, you'll see that this uptick is really due to some groups of women and not all. So hopefully um, in this uh, uh, conversation, we'll be able to um, um, highlight some of these uh, issues. So. Um, these are the um, most important landmark uh, randomized clinical trials that involve cardiovascular disease in women. And uh, the, uh, this HERS, or Heart and Estrogen Progestin Replacement Study, basically uh, showed that we no longer um, think that a hormone replacement therapy is beneficial for women. And this is old, but I think that a lot of people still think that because women are protected by estrogens at earlier uh, years, would that be beneficial later on? So this study really laid that to rest. Um, the Women's Health Initiative is still ongoing. You know, um, I think they'll probably stop at 200,000, but basically they're looking at, again, preventative mechanisms. They're looking at uh, uh, diabetes and uh, nutrition and other uh, preventative mechanisms that could be um, engaged upon to um, sort of uh, treat women over the time frame, and they enroll women um, age 50 to 79 and continue to observe them over time. The Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation, or WISE, this is an NHLBI um, initiative, um, and in this one, it gave us a lot of information about what happens to women when they come to be evaluated for ischemia. So these women were um, cardiac cats or diagnostic testing was performed on them, and we learned a lot of information about their anatomy, et cetera. So I'll be some, you know, sort of summarizing throughout my pre presentation some of the data that we um, um, got from these studies. Dr. Mosk, a good friend of mine, um, took a lot of this information and then was able to come up with strategies to risk stratify women um, as far as how, you know, how much at risk they are, whether they're at low risk, high risk, or at risk. And so at the end of the uh, discussion, I will show you how do you risk stratify women in order to decide, you know, should you be intervening on them or should you be um, just optimizing their medical uh, treatment? So this is no secret. Every minute in the United States, a woman dies from heart disease. We have more than one in three women living with uh, cardiovascular disease, and some groups we have uh, more issues. And I showed you the slide before where the death rates have steadily declined, but um, again, it's starting to rise, and uh, there are certain uh, women groups that are still less likely to receive testing and appropriate treatment uh, based on their presentation. But there's no secret that heart disease is the most common cause of death. And here um, you have um, three groups of women represented. Um, unfortunately, as I did my literature um, search, uh, there's not 
a lot of literature on, uh, you know, Asian women um, and the um, American Indian women. But I think that as, you know, time goes by, we need to focus a lot more time as they have specific risk factors and, you know, um, that could be prevented and, and intervened upon before they become deadly. But nevertheless, um, here we compare white, black, and Hispanic females, and of course, um, cardiovascular disease, including heart disease and stroke, is highest among these groups. And if you look at the red bar, this represents uh, black women and um, leads the pack when it comes to cardiovascular disease um, compared with white and Hispanic women and also stroke. I won't focus on stroke in this discussion. We just don't have time for that. So um, this is a, a young... Um, attending from um, Brown University who went and take, took a look back at the Women Health Initiative that I mentioned to you. It's still ongoing and they're still doing a lot of work, but basically went back and looked at postmenopausal women before and after 2005. And as you can see, very great representation for Blacks, not so much for Hispanics um, compared with whites. But what she found was very striking and this was published um, um, in JAHA last year. But what she found was that Black women with ST elevation MI had lower rates of treatment pre-2005, 15%, and post-2005, 39% lower, right? You would think that this would improve. Black women was 33% lower um, likely to get revascularization, regardless of the timing as they presented to the cath lab. And this is again within the study. And then they also, we know that you want to get people to the cath lab within 12 hours. They were 23% less likely to receive treatment within 12 hours of heart attack with symptoms. The Hispanic women also faced lower rates of treatment um, pre-2005, 23% lower, but the gap narrowed slightly after 2005. And so um, that, that's encouraging. And interestingly enough, um, when looking at the socioeconomic status of these women, there was no difference. So uh, again, something to think about. So um, when we're talking about women, very important to look at the risk factors, right? And um, I think the ones that are highlighted in yellow, because we, we think about um, older women and the family history, we know diabetes is a cardiovascular risk equivalent. But I think, especially for Black women, hypertension is a big issue um, for um, certain women, such as the Asian women and Hispanic metabolic syndrome. And for all women, you got to look at these other lifestyle risk factors, including um, inflammation and um, mental wellness. This is really a big contributor now that we're looking at in terms of um, cardiovascular disease. So, and the other important thing to recognize, because we think that women are protected uh, when they're younger, but you can have um, heart disease presence at any age. If you look at this slide, women in their 20s, 30s, heart disease may be present. I submit to you as they get older, that um, percent increases, but don't you know? just think that the women, because they're younger, are not likely to have um, some sort of cardiovascular disease issue. So hypertension, um, you all are familiar with the new guidelines, and I'm not going to belabor them here, but I think uh, because of the new guidelines, a lot more women are going to be um, diagnosed, hopefully, with hypertension and be intervened upon. And for women, high blood pressure doubles the risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, and um, again, as you can see here, um, I don't have information on Asian women for hypertension, but um, if you look at the three major groups, um, African-American females of over age 20, um, almost half of them are gonna have um, a, a diagnosis of hypertension um, by the time they hit over 20. Um, and here uh, is a breakdown um, among the groups. And so, uh, and, and compared with um, the males as well. So um, you have um, pre um, sort of the 1990s and sort of the, 90, the 2000 to 2006 era, and then um, later evaluation up to um, the recent um, uh, 2014 data. Um, and this is published in CERC last year. And if you look at hypertension among the groups, and again, you have um, all the females compared with uh, the males. Um, so here you have white females compared with uh, white males black females compared with black males, Mexican females compared with Mexican males. 
And again, um, you'll see that um, at all times for the um, black women, there's actually an increase in, in hypertension above all of the groups, but compared with black men, um, they're more likely to have a higher prevalence of hypertension. So very important to manage and evaluate, um, particularly in this group of uh, females. And is it, it's not due to lack of awareness or treatment, because here is a slide also from circulation that showed all of the groups, and now we actually have um, Asian um, females as well to compare. But the blue lines represent awareness, okay? And so you can see here in the middle, which is non-Hispanic Black, um, if anything, the Black females are a higher percentage likely to be aware of issues related to hypertension, and they're just as likely to be on treatment. Um, but when it comes to control, again, they're not well controlled. So I guess the um, importance of this slide is to say that despite the outcomes and the prevalence, they're, they're well aware and they're treated. So there's gotta be some other thing that we're missing in terms of being able to con uh, achieve control among the groups. Obesity um, is a big issue. Um, if you're 30 pounds or more overweight for a female, you're more likely to these, even if there are no other risk factors. Um, this is the way circumference for women and for men, but I submit to you, it's not just obesity. And when you look at particular groups, uh, something like visceral fat may be more important. And so on this next slide, we're comparing um, an African-American female on the left, on my left, and a Filipino female on the right. And um, the African, they're about uh, the same age. Uh, this the African-American female is 62 and the uh, Filipino woman is 69. Um, the African-American female weighs a lot more. So if you're talking about obesity, this uh, the African-American female weighs 160 pounds compared with 115 pounds um, with the Filipino female. But when you look at visceral fat that's uh, represented by the red, the uh, Filipino female has a lot more visceral uh, adiposity. Um, it's uh, in the black female, 25.4, compared with 84 in the uh, uh, Filipino female. So what might this mean? Well, um, visceral adipose tissue and fat is associated with the metabolic syndrome, and that can lead to issues later on. And here's another um, slide that, again, shows comparing uh, Filipinos, Caucasians, and uh, black females, and in the yellow line, the Filipino at every waist circumference um, has a higher amount of visceral adipose tissue compared with the other women. And uh, so here um, I talked about visceral adipose tissue being associated with metabolic syndrome. And, and these are, you know, are basically our standards. We have the World Health Organization, NCPE, and IDEA that looked at metabolic syndrome among uh, these groups of women. And in the middle, um, uh, the orange is the Filipino, and you can see that there's in all these different um, uh, studies that the um, Filipino women were more likely to have metabolic syndrome um, compared with the other women, even without cardiovascular disease or type two diabetes. So again, for this particular group of women, that's something you may need to focus on more in terms of risk factors that you can intervene upon for heart disease. So uh, the, the um, uh, Asian women is a rapidly growing segment of the US population with increased coronary artery incidence in the younger adults, high risk versus whites with equivalent risk factors. And the focus, um, you wanna focus on high prevalence for insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, elevate and the inflammatory markers, as well as um, LPL little a. And in this slide, it just shows the death rates for the Asian population. So we don't pay a lot of attention to that because the death rates appear to be lower. But if you look at these lines, you start, this is the blue line representing white race. And here you have um, the Asian population divided into Asian Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, and Vietnamese. And as you could see, um, there's a trend upwards for the um, Filipino, the Korean, uh, is not flattened out and uh, the uh, Asian Indian women. So you need to spend a lot of uh, time sort of recognizing that even though the death rates may be lower, I think there's uh, there are gonna be issues to come if we don't begin to intervene on these women. So the metabolic syndrome, why is it important? 
it more than doubles the risk of stroke in women. It increases the risk of death from heart disease by 3.5 times and increases the risk of dementia and diabetes. And it's inherently preventable and reversible. It's brought on by acquired causes of physical inactivity, diet, obesity, and of course, um, you know, uh, some genetic factors as well. But a lot of it could be reversible with regular physical exercise. In terms of um, physical activity and obesity, um, we mentioned that the African-American women are more likely to be obese compared with all the other women and among all the men, of course, as well, represented by the green bar. Um, and physical activity is um, one of the things that um, is not much engaged in by some, by some of these women, but especially uh, Black women. Uh, some of the uh, uh, reasons they give um, may be lack of access to certain places to exercise, as well as um, the expense, as well as other things, personal uh, sort of body questions that you need to ask. Some maybe, you know, um, have concerns about their hair, other things, but um, again, this is something we can in intervene upon. And we know that physical activity um, is um, going to be beneficial to reduce your um, heart disease risk. Um, and this is all data. Of course, um, you um, are supposed to have these women, encourage them to exercise at least 30 minutes on most days of the week. Um, newer data suggests that you can exercise in short bursts um, more frequently um, during the week, but um, certainly um, on most days of the week. But in order to lose weight, um, they have to exercise vigorously, vigorous exercise, at least 75 minutes or more per week. Um, so again, this is very important. And when certain excuses may be uh, made, uh, there are other ways that women can achieve exercise, um, dancing, um, you know, pushing a stroller, um, you know, cleaning the house. In other words, um, encouraging women to find other ways of exercising if they're not able or they don't have access to going to a gym. Uh, quickly, I'm not going to spend time on this because I know you're going to talk about diabetes, but this is a big issue um, with women. The numbers are growing, especially in the urban communities. Um, and if a woman has um, gestational diabetes, um, it's likely that she's going to develop uh, type 2 diabetes later on. So uh, it's a growing problem, and it's something, again, that is, uh, you know, manageable. Um, there are a lot of new drugs. Cardio cardiologists are now very much interested in managing um, a, a lot of these patients, as many of the new drugs can also um, improve heart failure and, and heart disease. But um, really um, pay attention to this, um, as especially in the urban communities, and you're right here at St. Uh, you, we're seeing a growing number of uh, younger women, um, you know, 17, 18, 19, already with uh, type 2 diabetes. And if you were to take a look at their arteries, they begin already to have atherosclerotic plaque um, laying down. So um, very, very important. <clears throat> In terms of cholesterol, the new guidelines state that there should be both primary and secondary prevention. Um, so a woman is not too young to ever get onto a statin. Um, and uh, there is the ASCVD score. Does anybody know the ASCVD risk estimator? Are you guys using that? Um, so for those who are not familiar, it is a guideline that's established by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. You should download this onto your cell phone. And basically, um, it asks for the age, the sex, uh, it acts on your race, but unfortunately, it just has um, white, black, or other, okay? Um, so there's room for improvement, but it also asks about the levels of uh, cholesterol. So your, it looks for your total cholesterol, your HDL, and your LDL. It asks about whether there's a presence of hypertension, diabetes, and smoking, um, where it's lacking, it doesn't ask about physical activity or anything like that, but it kicks out a percentage. And if um, it, it's, it's helpful if your patient is already not as, um, exhibiting cardiovascular disease. So if you're trying to decide if you should, you should put this woman on a statin 
and uh, you, you use this risk calculator, it's helpful. If you get over 10%, it's very clear this person should go on to a statin because it will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease over the next 10 years. If the percentage is less than 10%, then you're going to be engaging in lifestyle um, uh, modification. So it's very helpful because a lot of young women come in and they're like, well, I don't want to go on a statin. I'm going to get muscles, muscle spasms and muscle cramps, et cetera. But once you use this risk estimator, they can't really argue with that. It's an objective tool that has been widely studied and can help you to manage these women. Uh, HDL is very important for women. A low HDL is more important um, compared with men. And for every one milligram of deciliter increase in HDL, there's a 3% decrease in cardiovascular risk for women and compared with 2% for men. So you also want to look at your cholesterol HDL ratio because it's very predictive um, of heart disease in women. Um, and also look at triglyceride elevation because a higher triglyceride is associated with greater, greater atherogenic uh, significance in women compared with men. So some of the other risk factors we talked about, stress and anxiety, very important. In, in this day and age where everyone's balancing all these different things for women, this could be an independent risk factor that is oftentimes ignored. Um, and so um, again, with data from the Women's Health Initiative study, um, we see that depression is an independent predictor of coronary artery disease and death among women, even without any history or any um, significant contributors for uh, coronary heart disease. And um, this again is a large study and after 4.1 years of follow-up, they found that depression was independent, um, all cause mortality risk when adjusted for age, race, education, income, and the comorbidities of diabetes, hypertension, smoking, body mass index, physical activity, and increased cholesterol. So again, when you are taking care of your women, you want to establish whether there are any other contributors that you may not think of and focus on whether there's some sort of, um, you know, depressive um, behaviors being uh, exhibited, but really ask the question. Um, psychosocial stressors, this is another study um, that talked about marital stress. Um, and I submit to you, this is a smaller study, but it's kind of leading into what we talked about. Um, and this is just one example. I thought it was funny and interesting, so I included it here. But among women who were married or cohabitating with a male partner, marital stress was in, associated with an, almost a threefold increased risk of, of heart disease um, events. Living alone and work stress did not significantly increase heart disease events. But regardless of happiness or not, marriage or partnership benefits men. <laughs> so you, you cannot have an unhappy female in a partnership or marriage because that's going to increase their heart disease risk. So ask questions. Okay. And this little um, uh, schematic here um, is actually, how many of you have heard of the broken heart syndrome? Yeah, it's a real phenomenon. Um, basically, um, with significant stress, and I have seen, you know, um, uh, you know, examples of this in my own practice. Um, I, there was this one female whose husband um, unexpectedly passed away in the bed next to her. She presented with uh, shortness of breath, no typical risk factors. Um, initially, they were thinking that um, she had asthma or some sort of a pulmonary um, issue because she didn't have the typical risk factors. She went to internal medicine, she went to pulmonary, and then she was sent to cardiology. And she had an echo, and the echo shows uh, regional wall motion abnormality on the anterior part of the heart and global dysfunction. But when she went to the cath lab, there was no coronary artery disease. After she was placed on guideline-mediated therapy, uh, as far as managing her heart failure over time, this completely reversed. So this is a very striking example of uh, broken heart syndrome, but it can occur, and I see it often. They present; uh, they may either present as heart failure, or they may have they may present with um, shortness of breath. And when you do an evaluation, even on an echo, you may transiently see a re um, a segmental um, depression that indicates a particular. Um, region, but when you go to the cath lab, um, you will not find anything. You would not find atherosclerotic disease, and later on, it's reversible. But anyway, something to think of. And I consider this as a risk factor, the fact that women do not perceive um, heart disease as a major uh, threat. So a lot of women uh, are still uh, very afraid of cancer, 
as the um, the thing that they fear most. And I do submit to you, cancer is on the rise, breast cancer, but um, heart disease is still the leading cause of death. And so awareness is very important. It's improving, um, you know, after, um, again, a lot of the campaigns um, were um, initiated, we saw that women were more able to perceive heart disease as um, the, the leading cause of death. But now, as we start to see the rise again, you know, because a lot of the campaigns have sort of eased up, we're beginning to see the rise. So this can be considered to be a risk factor in, fa in the fact that women are not recognizing and thus not protecting themselves um, for um, risk for heart disease as much as they should. So your women may present and they may have symptoms that are atypical, and everyone knows what the typical symptoms are, the anginal clutching your, your chest, the Levine sign, but uh, women may not present that way. Um, and these are some of the ways that may be completely different. Pain in the upper back, jaw, a neck, uh, flu-like symptoms, stomach complaints, fatigue or weakness, anxiety, or loss of appetite or, or discomfort. And again, depending on the patient population that you're dealing with, they may either be very stoic they're the matriarch. They don't want to appear to be ill, so they're they're going to be minimizing their symptoms. And then you have the other groups that may be um, over um, sort of or very, you know, sort of uh, vocal in their symptoms. And you have to be able to tease out, you know, exactly what's going on. And again, this is really listening to your your women and, and looking at the different patient populations and recognizing how they may present differently in order to make um your diagnosis and, and engage in a treatment plan. So I just wanted to include a case um, as an example of um, what I was just talking about. Um, so this is an 86 year old woman and she's, uh, she says she has com complicated coronary artery disease. This is how she presented. Um, and she went to an outside, a different hospital outside of Mount Sinai uh, systems. Um, and uh, she was evaluated there. So she's a very tiny female. She was always complaining that she's short of breath. She has uh, complicated, um, you know, heart disease, but wasn't able to give any more um, sort of uh, information. And um, basically, um, they, after um, some analysis, they, they did a, an echo, a trans echo. Um, but I think it was done in like a primary office. They thought that it, that she had MR. It wasn't which is mitral regurgitation, that it wasn't very well um, quantified on the echo. Uh, but because of the complaints of shortness of breath at the outside hospital, she went for a cardiac cap. And uh, she's a very tiny female. So, you know, the, the anatomical structures are, as you know, for women, a little bit different. Anyway, cath was complicated by a pseudoaneurysm. So she had a pseudoaneurysm in her groin. Um, and then then she also ended up developing a DVT, maybe because she was favoring the leg and not moving around. She ended up with a DVT and she ended up with a filter. So, of course, you know, now uh, when people don't want to touch her, or don't want to do anything with her. Right. So she presents to a Mount Sinai hos uh, hospital or doctor. This was the calf that she had um, that was reviewed from the outside hospital. And it shows that the, this is the left coronary system and the right coronary system, which showed no coronary artery disease. But she had a, a elevated uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and she had a large V wave, right? So that in, indicates there's high filling pressure somewhere, right? Um, and this was her her chest X-ray. What do you think of that heart? Looks very big, right? Remember, she's very tiny. See, she's very tiny, but she has a big heart. So. Um, what would you do next? She, you know, she, we think there's a cardiac issue, but now she's afraid of procedures and doctors. She's still very symptomatic and complaining. Um, she had a bad outcome from cath. What, what would anyone here do? You're at Mount Sinai Systems now, St. Luke's, you know, so you're going to be providing guideline mediated interventions and analysis. So what would be the next step? Anyone? Okay. Well, Nobody wants to hazard a guess, but they repeated the echo, right? Because um, the echo she had was an outpatient echo and it wasn't good. And they took her, we were talking before about interventions and how sometimes, you know, institutions are very intervention heavy, but which is the right test. So they did a cath, but they didn't do an echo. Um, she had high filling pressure, so something was going on. So they did an echo. 
Um, and then based on that, it did a TEE. And what does she have? Severe MR. Severe. This is uh, basically showing you, this is not playing, but it basically, this is your mitral valve. It's flailed and it's showing severe MR. This MR filled up the entire left atrium. So now you have someone with uh, severe MR and symptoms. What happened? She's a tiny female. What do you do with her? She's afraid of doctors. She doesn't want to have open heart surgery. So this is where um, the discussion comes in. What do you do for a female like this that would help? So instead of um, offering her open heart surgery, um, because everyone thinks she has high risk, so maybe you could consider a mitral clip um, in this patient. And that's what she had. She ended up having an edge-to-edge -edge repair mitral clip. And now this is the, her MR. Trivial. Okay, before the MR was filling up the entire left atrium and causing symptoms. So being persistent, looking at the female, you know, finding out that, okay, yes, yeah, she's a tiny female, she has complications, but let's figure out what's going on. Let's do further analysis. Um, an echo is very good um, to, uh, especially a stress echo, to make an um, analysis for women. This was done and um, it was found now she had severe MR and it saved her life. So... Um, some tests are less accurate in women, and you have to look at the test and decide which is the test that you're going to be doing and which one are you going to be following up for with your women. Okay, so um, recognizing, for instance, a lipid profile, you want to really focus on the HDL and look at the ratio, um, not just a total. Okay, and look at other newer um, uh, lipid markers such as LPL little a. Recognizing that the EKG can have false positive um, you know, uh, findings for women. So if they do just a simple stress test, you may end up having a false positive uh, for women. So you need some sort of other imaging modality. Um, ECHO, I submit to you, is functional and um, you get a lot of good information. So oftentimes this is a very good uh, test for women. Uh, nuclear studies, because of the anatomy, um, uh, breasts and so on, you can have um, uh, abnormalities um, of the uh, anterior wall. Of course, in a good lab, such as at St. Luke's, you know that you should flip the patient or prone them to get additional information. Cardiac catheterization may not um, be diagnostic for women. And I think I have a schematic that shows as women tend to have diffuse disease um, uh, instead of a discrete um, stenosis. And so you, you would have to follow up with um, FFR or some sort of analysis of pressure to see if there's a pressure drop off if you don't see a discrete stenosis. So again, um, a stress echo is very helpful. You get a lot of functional information. Um, you can talk to the patient. Um, and then you also have an imaging modality that um, would, not, would, would be very clear and not necessarily give you a false positive or negative. This is the schematic um, that I was discussing um, uh, before about the cardiac cath. So in A, you see that um, this is the lumen of the artery, and um, you see that there's a discrete stenosis and a drop-off in pressure if you were to do a flow wire. Um, so that's very clear. There's also atherosclerotic plaque outside of the vessel, but you could see this very discrete stenosis. So if you came to the cath lab, this would be stented. Um, for a, a female, they tend to have, um, a, you know, sort of diffuse narrowing along the entire vessel, but there's atherosclerotic burden um, outside of the uh, artery. And if you were to do a flow wire, you see the same job off. So this woman needs to be on optimal um, cardiac medications just as much as A, even though there's no uh, stent, but she's going to need to be on all of the um, guideline directed um, therapy to treat her coronary artery disease just as the person in A. And, um, you know, additionally, we're finding that um, ca um, calcium screening may be, may be helpful. If you have an asymptomatic low risk woman, it may be appropriate to, um, uh, you know, use this to assess because if you see um, any amount of calcium in a low risk woman, it's associated with an increased risk for heart disease, uh, coronary uh, heart disease events. So I know that um, it's not widely used, but it could be used as an adjunct if you are suspecting more um, uh, you know, disease than, than is being evidenced. Another thing that I use uh, a lot for my women is uh, cardiac CT. At Sinai, we have a good relationship um, and we're able to do cardiac CT. So a lot of women who, they may have a stress test that's um, that I don't believe, I'll send them on for cardiac CT and then you could directly see the anatomy. So I talked before about risk stratification. And again, this is a work of Lori, Lori Masta. 
Um, so you want to um, be able to stratify women at high risk um, and intermediate risk and at risk. So a high risk woman is a woman who has diabetes, who has documented atherosclerotic disease by one of these ways, or now chronic kidney disease, and they have a 10-year Framingham global risk of greater than 10%. Your at-risk women um, are women that have these uh, risk factors that you may not think about, but they're at risk. Um, and you need to begin to um, you know, uh, intervene upon in terms of getting very aggressive with lifestyle, lifestyle interventions and medications. So uh, cigarette smoking, hypertension, dyslipidemia, family history, no question, right? But obesity, especially essential obesity and visceral adiposity, of course, physical inactivity and diet. But look, the metabolic syndrome, okay, is a big issue. So if your women have metabolic syndrome, they're at risk for heart. And then these are some of the other things that we're, dis we're discovering. So if, if, for instance, they exercise, they have a poor exercise capacity or abnormal heart rate recovery, which is after stress test, their heart rate stays elevated, so-called deconditioning. This is a risk for heart disease. And again, uh, please pay a lot of attention now. And I didn't have time in this talk to talk about uh, the pregnancy type uh, issues, but make sure, you know, if somebody has pregnancy induced hypertension, gestational diabetes, or preeclampsia, this is a risk for heart disease. And of course, inflammation, any of these inflammatory processes. I just want to end by saying make sure women are on all the guideline mediated therapies, very good and indicated for men. They're also indicated for women. The um, one thing I would caution about is with aspirin. Um, and I know there's a lot of back and forth and the, the, um, the article that came out in the New York Times, I'm sure a lot of your women are asking you, should, you be, should she be on aspirin? Aspirin is indicated in, if they have coronary artery disease unless, unless contraindicated for some reason. This is a class one level of evidence A. So if they have coronary artery disease, if it's not contraindicated, they need to be an aspirin, lifelong aspirin. It's reasonable to consider it in someone with diabetes because type two diabetes is a risk equivalent for heart disease. And they already may have um, pathophysiological changes in their vessels and um, at um, a, an organ level that you're not uh, seeing. So it would be reasonable to um, get these patients also on therapy. Um, and if women are intolerant of aspirin, but they're high risk, then clopidogrel should be substituted. This is class one level of evidence B. Um, if someone does not have any kind of structural abnormalities, so if you do an echocardiogram, you don't see any kind of LVH, or if you've done a stress test or whatever, if there's no structural abnormalities in a woman without the risks that I mentioned before, they probably should not be on aspirin. Hormone uh, therapy, um, you know, the, the four trials that I mentioned before really gave us a lot of data. And um, if it, it doesn't protect women against heart disease, that's the short end of the story. It doesn't protect. But if women have issues where they need to be on uh, hormone therapy for other reasons, um, GYN issues, then it should be, um, then you should use it. Um, so the world, you know, women heart, um, the WHI study showed, confirmed that combination therapy for postmenopausal women does not help, does not help. And, um, and then also there was another study that looked at 727 subjects and they looked at carotid intermomedial thickness and it did not reduce atherosclerotic risk. And so therefore, um, please keep that in mind when taking care of your patients. And so in summary, CVD is still a major concern for women. It's the leading cause of death. You have to evaluate women according to the risk factors that may be more unique or prominent to a particular individual and carefully define what testing is important. Make sure that they are on uh, guideline-mediated therapy, just like for men, um, after you stratify them into high at or at-risk uh, categories, and then avoid therapies that may not be helpful. So I'd like to uh, end there and um, take any questions that you may have. Thank you. At last, uh, the half population or the one half population has been so kind of ignored because uh, they allegedly looked at to study. 
But uh, I want to ask uh, two questions. One is uh, most of them are getting mammograms. Yes. And they're finding that calcification or mammograms may be associated with risk there, but in fact, they're picking up uh, coronary calcium as well from standard mammograms. So, do you have any information on that in terms of another factor to lead you to doing a further assessment? Sure. So I think in, in these women, if they don't have any other uh, risk factors, one of the things you may want to do, I mentioned before, is maybe doing a calcium score. And again, if you're low risk and if there's any um, evidence of uh, increased calcium, then you should further evaluate these women. So I think that if you have yeah, mam mam yeah uh, calcium in your mammogram, then you may have calcium in your coronary arteries as well. And if you can get that test, then, then that's a test that you should do. Uh, is there a different way to approach women who are disabled or paraplegic uh, in some kind of or with another disorder? And how do you then assess them and manage them because they can't exercise and they can't do certain things that we would ask them to do? That's My a last question is how do you decide between 75 and 125 milligrams of aspirin? Okay, so um, the first question about women who are not able to exercise. So um, Dr. Seward talked about the programs that I do in Central Harlem. I've been doing a program there for the last, since 2012. Um, and no surprise, most of them are women. And now we have over 3,000 encounters. And uh, many of them have multiple comorbidities and they're not able to, even if they wanted to, they, they couldn't go to a gym. So we find different ways of them being able to be physically active. So yesterday, one of the we had an opening programs, and one of the things that I gave them is an elastic band. Okay, you guys. So they can. So in other words, there are other ways they can exercise besides going to the gym, and this may be one way. They can stretch and exercise. They can move around. They could do um, low low level weights or whatever. Just being um, more active than not is important. Um, and again, you're going to look at the other lifestyle risks. Um, in terms of the low um, dose aspirin, um, so in the studies, um, 75 was low dose, commercially available, mainly you can find 81 milligrams. So that's the dose that is indicated um, for maintenance for women. Um, if someone's acutely having a coronary artery uh, issue, then they get the full dose aspirin. Any other questions? Is there a uh, there are, I didn't um, focus on that, but um, there were, there are some um, studies, um, not so much looking at racial differences, but wh whether the menopause is early or late. Um, and for those women who tend to have earlier menopause, they have a higher risk of um, coronary artery disease. But that's something to look at. Um, um, and I think it may be important, uh, you know, prognosticator to, to uh, if we can find out whether there's a difference um, among women for who have um, early menopause compared with others. But I just don't have that data. I can only tell you that having an earlier menopause may be predictive of uh, heart disease. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Thanks for a great talk. You mentioned LP middle A several times. Are you recommending checking that mostly for risk stratification since statins don't usually treat that? And I'm not sure that a lot of other people have to try and change their levels. Right. <clears throat> when, <coughs> when a woman Besides the typical risk factors, I look for markers of inf inflammation or any other contributors. Um, and you're correct. Um, this is not something that would be treated by aspirin, but then you would, uh, if you have abnormal levels, then you know that you should be more super aggressive in these women in terms of managing all of the other risk factors. Um, and then there are certain vitamins, and I didn't get into this. One of my colleagues at um, Johns Hopkins looked at, and that's a whole other lecture you may want to consider having someone here, because women present with all these different supplements that they take. But um, folic acid or folate may be helpful um, with LP a little A, but not statins. But again, if it's abnormal, I know that this is one other ditzel that may be contributing to my female who's going to end up having additional issues. So it just helps me to be more aggressive in managing the other issues and recommending supplements that I know may work for her. Can you repeat it for me? 
Did you, if you could hear the question and repeat it to me, that would be great. So can we get the volume somehow increased downtown? <laughs> maybe move closer to the mic. I mean, yourself move closer to the mic. <laughs> Not really much about it. I think Sarah's going to talk to that maybe people. You had a question in the meanwhile? I don't know if you can make one of these great things. I was just wondering if you could just briefly discuss upon uh, hot day in the moment, especially if we're spotting about it in the end of the week. And hopefully it can be managed uh, with the instrument regular hot failure. I know it's a huge topic. Okay. So um, there that that could be an entire lecture in and of itself. Heart failure is so important. But um, in the KEEPS trial um, and Kronos, uh, they addressed our preeclampsia in women. And um, what they uh, found is that number one, uh, especially this is where there's a difference in African American women, they're more likely to have um, uh, preeclampsia, which is hypertension. And then these women, when they followed them postpartum, were more likely to have um, markers of heart failure. The other thing um, that they looked at in these women, if they had chronic renal insufficiency, that was an additional uh, risk factor for women for heart failure later on. But uh, basically, if someone's high risk, um, you're gonna be um, you know, managing them with echoes and looking at their echocardiogram as they're pregnant and throughout their pregnancy and up to three months postpartum because they can still develop a weakened myocardium postpartum. Um, in terms of treating them, you know that the um, neurohormonal drugs are um, teratogenic for the fetus and um, it, it also can be expressed in breast milk. So um, we, we know that there's a lot of good medicines out there now, uh, particularly the ARNI inhibitors or Entresto, but they're not allowed, they cannot have this. So um, uh, beta blockers, uh, diuretics, uh, digoxin, these would be the mainstay of someone who is in heart failure during any pregnancy. Uh, and uh, again, um, if someone is already demonstrating uh, that they have a weak heart, or that they have a cardiomyopathy, uh, it probably is a soft call to tell them not to uh, go through pregnancy, but I have actually gone through uh, with patients. I Actually, there was one patient um, who had a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, was 27 years old, and I hadn't seen her for several months, and she's on an ACE inhibitor, and she shows up to me and tells me she's pregnant. So the first thing I did was to get high-risk OB involved. You have to make sure that there's a team effort um, I got her off of the um, ACE inhibitor and I got her onto a beta blocker and, and diuretics and sort of followed her through. Long story short, she made it through, but we had frequent echoes, analyses, and at the time of delivery, uh, you want to you wanna actually control that delivery. You don't want her to have a vaginal delivery. So you control the delivery, make sure that it's going to be a cesarean section and that you have the entire team there and ready. So in the room, you should have an anesthesiologist, high-risk OB, and the cardiologist ready to um, deal with this woman uh, when she's going through um, her delivery and follow her post-op with echoes. Do we have that question yet? Yeah. Try. Try. We'll be very quiet. Okay. Oh, okay. She's text texting you a question. Can you guys hear us?
the, the, the answer, the question is what percentage sustained durable weight loss? Oh, okay, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, well, you know, I, I can't tell you what percentage uh, sustained durable weight loss, but I can tell you that I'm recommending now that a lot of my patients who present with obesity, um, we're referring them for um, laparoscopic gastric sleeves, and um, we're seeing significant benefits in a lot of these women losing over 100 pounds, et cetera. And so there's a team you know, sort of approach um, because once these women lose weight, um, if their stressors or whatever it was that led to them getting to the weight in the first place, those are not gonna go away. So you need to continue to have them uh, see, uh, you know, uh, not only a primary cardiologist, but also a nutritionist and a dietitian. So I can't tell you what percentage uh, in general of all comers um, uh, will maintain their weight loss, but if they're engaged in mechanisms to address some of the other stresses, as I mentioned before, they tend to keep their uh, weight off um, more. At uh, Sinai, we have a, a wellness center, and I participate in that. And so part of the what we do to ensure that women keep their weight off, I have an endocrinologist, um, and I have a dietitian that's there as well. And we also have, and I'm lucky in this, in this regard, there's a cardiac rehab that's there, but we also have what's called med fitness. So we're able to have them sign up and they're observed. So again, what would help them to maintain their weight loss is to continue sort of a team effort and a group effort to make sure that that happens. And in those patients, I think they would end up having more sustained weight loss over time because otherwise there would be a rebound if they're continuing to engage in some of the, the behaviors that got them there in the first place. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, okay. My pleasure. Okay, thank you.